Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Sandy. Do I sound crystal clear to you this evening? You sound good. Uh, uh, you're you're much darker in the evening than it is here in good old New York City, but but you're lit by candlelight. So I yeah, you're lit you're by candlelight. You're, you're you're literally something out of a Renaissance painting tonight. <laughs> well, I do try. Do you have a skull and a and a, and a dead ferret on the, on the table in front of <laughs> An you? An ermine. No. Uh, anyway. For people who know what we usually do, often, mostly, it's me picking what we speak about, me preparing mm. the slides this evening. I have prepared the slides because you can't be left to your own devices to do that. Well, I don't have PowerPoint, so. <laughs> you don't live in the dark ages. Um, but you've chosen a topic and you've decided the images that we will look at this evening. But I have chosen the title, The Editors, um, because as far as I can tell from what you sent me, we are going to be talking about how through time, people revise, revisit, edit, and restore sure. other people's work. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I think that, I think what I had planned to talk about tonight is in many ways and I'm going to own this statement for the day. Uh, you could argue that it, that what I'm about to say is a very masculine uh, uh, statement, which is that um, the objects in it's a very Western idea that the object itself is imbued with 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 all of this this meaning and reality you know what i mean it's like a very hard reality of the thing that was made by someone and there is this object and if it gets changed or mutated or cut or destroyed or entropy eats it away i tend to feel like something is being lost although you could argue that that's just what art does time does to art you know and we have to we have to sort of deal with it I know this um, but is I, not I, the point, Bill, but I, I don't see the relationship between that and something masculine. masculinity. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So I just think that maybe for me, there's something very uh, active and action based in uh, reality and, and worrying about uh, a physical object. I don't know. That, that feels masculine to me. It feels like a, a weird, you know, hunter bringing something back kind of thing to me. Uh, it's it's less about the art, and it actually is about the object. Um, it's you know, it, there's an interesting thing here. Go to the first slide for a second. There's an interesting. All right, bossy boots. <laughs> well, I can't control it from here. <laughs> okay. So this, as anyone who's been to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, uh, is the centerpiece. By the way, what like 30 feet away from this are like three Vermeers, which if you ever go, make sure you don't miss the Vermeers when you're in the room. Um, but this is the Night Watch, which is at Rijksmuseum, as Rembrandt is In the Room huge. of Honor. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know the exact dimensions. Do you, do you have offhand like a general sense? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this is obviously the kind of thing we're going to be talking about because this is it as a cut down version of what, what would have three been by four meters. What, what, is, what is it? Well, I put it in feet because you always moan when I do it in metrics. Okay. So I did 15, Nine by 12 feet. No, 15 by 13. 15 by 13. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a big painting. Those, those men in the front are in the foreground are basically life size. Um, and this is obviously from 1642. Uh, apparently it hung in one building for a hundred years and then uh, was moved. And when they moved it, they cut off a slice on the left, a small slice on the right, and a little bit on the top and bottom in order to make it fit. Yeah. Which just goes to show you how differently people of that age thought about art, not quite the way we do as well, objects. I don't know about that, actually. I was thinking a lot about this in context of okay. um, the other paintings that you've given us. 
1642, and Rembrandt yep. paints a masterpiece. Um, the painting gets moved into the town hall eventually, which is yep. a very prestigious place for the painting to hang. At that time in history, um, people would have been used to paintings, obviously, hanging in frames um, in places that were somehow gilded. But also, um, a lot of people who were involved in art or understood art would have been used to fresco. And so the fact that they cut it down to fit it between two doorways at the town hall actually makes perfect sense because they wanted to treat it as if it was part of the wall. The wall, yeah. Yep. Yeah, which I which I totally get. I, I just feel like, you know, you could have also, I don't know, folded it behind or, so, you know what I mean? Found some way or, or kept the scraps. Cause I, as far as I know, they were lost, correct? Uh, what we know of the missing pieces is that there were copies done before it was cut. So we know generally what was in the missing spots. Well, there's um, a replica made 12 years later. Yeah. Um, I don't know why that was made. I, I don't know if it was hung somewhere else in honor or if it just really was like a facsimile or at what what it was for but yeah so 12 years after the original yeah um I wrote his name but what's down. interesting is that for the last 300 years or so 270 years or whatever it is this is how people have known this painting mm. um and by the way they've done brand new super 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 high-res scans of this painting which are available online which is amazing. You can zoom all the way into, you know, brush strokes. Mm. Um, and if you're into that kind of thing, this is a very good example of what technology can do to bring that kind of thing to people who maybe can't visit Amsterdam. Um, but what I kind of found interesting about it was the idea that on the, the Google site, so Google created artificial intelligence software. They created an AI, which was used to reintegrate in the missing pieces um, by analyzing the style and the brush strokes and the colors and everything of the way it was and then using the copy as a reference they let this ai basically fill in the missing bits well it's called convolutional yep. neural network correct yes uh wait you're the one bringing up the uh jargony uh tech stuff that's great I don't understand the tech. You... I'm not pretending to understand what that AI is, but I know what it is. I know what it's called. Well, what I found interesting is on the Google site, it said uh, something along the lines of, this is now back the way it was as Rembrandt intended it. So hang on, before we get a bit ahead of ourselves, we're still looking yep. at the painting. At the, the, the painting as it is now, yes. Um, uh, so if you go to the next slide, yeah, there you go. This so is... you can see that there's stuff on the left hand side. You can see that yeah. it's a bridge now. Uh, there's a little bit on the right hand side. And even there's a, the way that they showed it on one of the sites, it seemed like there was actually some added ground on, like on the bottom. Neither of these images that I've pulled seem to have more ground on the bottom, but I always felt like those guys were a little bit close to the edge. Um, yeah, I mean, there, I mean, I wrote down the things that had been cut off. So from the bottom, it lost five inches. Yeah, which is not insubstantial. Mm. Yeah. Um, it just but lifts the them thing, up from the, the border a little bit. The thing that is amazing when we do see it like this, um, so-called restored, or at least um, in some way replicated. Can we say it's replicated, actually? Is this replicated? replicated? I don't know. What, what, why would you use that word? Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find a word. If I say replicated, it seems to be that it's been copied through AI. Yeah. Fine. But interestingly enough, only the edges, right? But, like the rest of it is the way it was. Yeah. yeah. So, well, that would be the replication part, wouldn't it? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I, I mean, the painting this way, the second way or the original way rather. Yeah is you know kind of beautiful in its movement i mean it was already a very dynamic painting everybody who knows the night watch knows it as a as a as a painting of real kind of um power that kind of forward push there's so much happening in that kind of tunnel space to to bring us into a foreground where stuff is is happening even if it's 
um, notional. So they're not perhaps wielding their sword, but he does have his hand outstretched. We're not already in the battle, but we've got the lances out. It's full of movement and dynamism. But with the additional part, or should we, again, we shouldn't call it the additional part, the original part still there. Yeah. We've got a composition that was really carefully calculated by Rembrandt. And the yeah. subtle difference is that in the version we, we tend to know, which is the one with the sides locked off, the archway at the back is offset, but yep. it centralizes the figures. Whereas in the original composition, as Rembrandt would have intended it, we've got a centralized archway and the lieutenant is offset in white. That gives an incredible kind of curved sense coming into the movement space at the foreground of the painting. I think that the proportions completely change the way it feels to me. Mm. But I this mean, is like a tumble that most of, the... of people. You know, yes, this, exactly. This in a way that the other one is still. not. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of amazing that such, I mean, because you really look at the differences. It's a couple people on the left and like half a dude on the right. But somehow <laughs> just shifting it just a little bit like that. You're laughing because I said, dude. It's that dude over on the right. <laughs> yes. Somehow, I mean, I think you and I agree at this. Like it, it feels better this way. Like it feels more Wait. balanced this way. <laughs> Hold the phone. You and I agree. This once, I think, One you know, thing. after how many episodes have we done? Like 40 episodes, like just that. this once we're going to choose to, <laughs> to agree. But I, I, that's the point that I was going to bring up is that, you know, obviously Rembrandt was gone dead by the time they lopped these sides off of this thing. But it is interesting that, you know, we keep the guy's name on this thing, even though it's not actually what he made in some ways. Like, you know, it's, I, I just, I, I sometimes will take a photograph and I will comp, com, compose it a very specific way. And then, you know, some editor or whatever it is will crop it in some weird way and stick it in a magazine with my name under it. And I'm just like, oh God, that looks terrible that way. So does this you mean can't that just pop Mark things enters, out of stuff. Does this mean that work that has some way been cropped or changed by a receiver becomes somehow no longer belonging to the artist? Like, is there a, a destruction of the artist and work relationship? I think that there is, yes, I think there is, but I, but I think that in some ways, A, and I'm not saying they can't do this because they did it and there's nothing you can do about it, but I think it does the artist a disservice a little bit because it sort of is, is, is putting their authorship on a, on, a, on a book that you edited down. You know what I mean? It's like, well, that's not what the person who wrote it was saying. You just lopped 17 pages out of the book. It's no longer the book. It's not Romeo and Juliet anymore because you took out the second act or whatever. It might not um, be, but does it not still belong to Shakespeare? Well, I, I think that by saying that it still belongs to Shakespeare, in some ways, if I were Shakespeare, and I've done this before in photographs of my own, where somebody really wanted to change things in a certain way or edit them a certain way, and I'd be like, listen, I'd rather you didn't, but if you insist on doing that, please don't put my name on it because that's not what I did. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're taking something and you're turning it into something else, which I don't like, but like that, I don't, I don't want people to perceive that as a decision that I made in the same way that I know times are different. He was dead. It was years later, but like if I was Rembrandt and I was still alive when they lopped the sides off, I'd be like, what are you doing? You destroyed what I just spent all this time meticulously trying to figure out how to weight this thing in mm -hmm. such a way that it feels like this group of people and you just, you immutably changed it in a way that, well, immutably up until Google invents some convoluted AI. Um, you changed it in a way that is no longer representative of my intention. I think this in itself though is kind of thorny philosophically around art and to do with ownership and possession anyway. Sure. So again, we've probably touched on this many times before. An artist makes a piece of work and they send it out into the world to be seen and experienced. And in so doing, I wonder if they relinquish that, that which they have created. Well, I think that they relinquish the ability for, to tell people 
to, to control what people think about it and what people say about it and how people see it. But you know, if you, if you, if you take a Picasso and then you splatter red paint on top of it, it's no longer a Picasso. It's something else. Like you, know, you just, you just. Interesting. I, I, just, I mean, um, there's a bit of a switch with this. I mean, Rauschenberg, who we're going to look at later. Yep. Erased a drawing. It was de Kooning's, right? But like, right. but he, I mean. De Kooning. Yeah, but um, I was actually almost, I almost used that, by the way, as one of our example study, but he asked permission to do it. And he, it was now his work. It wasn't de Kooning's work anymore. Hmm. You know, yeah, by the way, isn't that. Yeah. No one remembered de Kooning through that Rauschenberg action. Yes, but if de Kooning wasn't also a famous artist in his own right, I don't think people would remember whose work he destroyed. Mm. You know what I mean? We, we no longer care what it was that he removed. We just know, oh, he got some other famous friend of his to allow him to destroy something that he cared about. And that's like the story, which is fine. But ultimately, that is now a Rauschenberg piece. It's not a de Kooning piece anymore. You know? I don't know. Have you, have you ever had something you've made changed by somebody else after the fact? Well, um, I know that one of the first exercises I did at art school was we were set up as a, quite a large drawing class, maybe 25 of us. And our tutor asked us to create a piece of work based on the view outside the window. Mm -hmm. And so 25 art students set about jostling for position, as is the way in art college, who's going to make the best image, whatever that means. But nonetheless, we were all invested in what we were doing. And we were all at our boards are easels and mm -hmm. we'd been working maybe for two hours something like that and so most of us had got quite a lot of work on the surfaces of the paper I think we were working on and the tutor stopped us all and asked us to move away from our work and to move clockwise around the room to the next board and you know smugly we probably thought oh well we're going to appraise somebody else's work no. It said continue. We were going to deface somebody else's work. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, it's a really old trick in, in kind of getting people to come to terms with the transient nature of work we make. It was so challenging. People freaked out. People were upset. People were really angry. I remember it's one of like the key experiences of my life as an artist really was this almost, I think the first or second day at art college. Um, and so to have my work changed, I remember feeling very uh, struck by the sense of possessiveness that I had about this thing that I was proud of. Mm, and I didn't like it. And then it became different through the defacement somebody else applied. Did you like what they changed? Yes, and actually eventually part of the task was to return to our original work and to complete it. So we right. had to work with what someone else had done to our original. Right. But at that point, it's a collaboration, right? I mean, that's... It was a fascinating uh, sense of, of being brought in really close to something that was um, filled with pride and position and then being pinged out brutally and then gradually being wheeled back in again. Sure. Um, I can't imagine though, in a commercial or professional context, having work stolen, taken and changed. And I use the word stolen. Stolen is a very violent word, isn't it? It's a quite sure. an emotive word, but I would imagine there are lots of artists who experience where their images are hijacked somehow, stolen. But again, that implies this total ownership. And I, I, I also grapple with that. Who really owns art emotionally, philosophically? Somebody can buy it. Sure. 
I mean, I, for me, it becomes more of a reputational hazard than, you know, I, it's not an ego thing so much as a, I don't like that. That's not what I was trying to do. And if somebody sees that and it has my name on it and they think that I'm a crappy photographer, cause you know, somebody put a crappy filter on something on Instagram. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't, I don't want to be related to that. If somebody sees it and thinks, Oh, Bill doesn't know what he's doing because he allowed whatever. So for me, it's more of a professional reputation issue than it is some sort of ego. How dare you change something that was so perfect, you know? That's a professional reputation thing, though, uh, amongst other professionals, would you say? Uh, I don't know. I mean, for with people who are heightened to notice the difference between those kinds of things, you know? Mm. I mean, most people probably wouldn't even know the difference or still think it looked good defaced, as it were. But it's like, there's something about it for me that I spend a lot of energy getting it the way I want it. And if somebody just suddenly changes it, then that's not mine anymore. You know, it's, it's something else, which is arguably fine, but don't put my name on it anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, I just, I think I, it's just so interesting because this Rembrandt is a good example of pretty subtle amount of stuff was removed maybe what, like 5% of it, but it really does change the way the painting feels, mm. you know? It does. I, I mean, do wonder so, though, I mean, the, the, the part that we now see that's over on the, on the left there, and we've got uh -huh. these other couple of characters, um, you know, they aren't actually vital characters to this scene. No, it's more just the proportions and where other things stick that is important. Yeah, yeah, it's to do with the composition. Yep, absolutely. Um, and in fact, I think that the the whoever it is, you know, the person way over on the left, I feel like the AI made them brighter than they probably would have been. Yeah, they've got a kind of cast glow around them, don't they? Yeah, which because a handful of other people, including that little girl in the middle and some other people have that. So it probably thought, oh, it needs to have one of those over here in order to weight this differently. But I don't think he would have put that much highlight on somebody in the edge. I think that person would have been pushed back just like the guy next to him. Mind you, when we look but, over on the other side, yep. um, we look at the face of the drummer, for example. Yeah. Can you go back to the cut version? I just want to see what the difference is. Okay, so we don't lose that much. It's basically just the back of the helmet on that guy and a little bit more of the drummer. Mm. Okay, you can go back to the other one. Sorry. I wonder it's mostly if, that those two guys aren't cut off, you know, mm. in the way that they were mid-head. Sorry, I, didn't, I mean, didn't mean to cut you off. Mm. I can't remember what I was going to say, but anyway, I mean, this is testament to how different a painting can appear with, as you're saying, actually quite subtle changes. Is it subtle though to cut off two feet off the edge of a painting? Yeah. I think in context of the time, what I said is really uh, relevant that people were used to seeing paintings that covered complete walls. Yep. And so whoever did this, I don't think was, was being deliberately wicked. Disrespectful. Or disrespectful. Yeah. I think actually it was a sign of respect that they wanted to put it across the whole wall, but the wall yep. they had simply wasn't big enough for this vast canvas. Yeah. I just, could you imagine anybody doing this nowadays with, I mean, I guess at the time it was a hundred year old painting. It wasn't a 400 year old painting, you know. Uh, well, we could talk about this in lots of different ways now in terms of even digital art. Sure. How easily that is to kind of, um, or not uh, actually tamper with in some way or appropriate well, it, or. Yeah, um, but isn't it, it's also interesting that the, the thing, the, the, restoration that they did is a digital restoration they didn't yes. add this paint back to the original thing it's really just oh we scanned it we extended it this is probably what it looked like before it was cut down and now yeah. there's this weird archival restored version in digital well, form you know I, I think actually in many ways this is a very respectful way to do it yeah yeah which is precisely what my yep you're 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 on the same wavelength as me for once. <laughs> the one time only. <laughs> um, okay, so here's another one of the famous restorations of all time. Uh, 
I mean, I can give you the timeline of this. I mean, it's it's utterly incredible. You know, I mean, this was painted. uh, I'm sure you do know all the science about this and the kind of... Yeah. Uh, the the problems actually when da Vinci was even painting this he'd been commissioned by the Duke of Milan and um, yep. it was painted on the wall of the refectory the family hoped the Sforza family I think they were called hoped one day that the the refectory and the monastery would actually become their mausoleum so they were kind of preparing for the grandeur of death through this painting yep. um, but Leonardo had never painted something this scale before. I mean, this is also huge. Um, and nor had he worked particularly with fresco before. Yeah, and, um, he, and he messed with the way that he did the fresco, correct? Like he, he did. did something different, yeah. He did because, I, I mean, it's really curious because, I mean, we know Leonardo da Vinci is the polymath uh, genius. You know, he, he was so smart why this didn't occur to him, you know, oil and water don't mix. Um, And also fresco painting is usually a very rapid process because fresco is the application of pigment to wet plaster. But he took three years to paint this. Now that's not just to do with its scale. I mean, you can still make a big painting in a shorter amount of time. And one yeah. could argue that had he worked on canvas, he could have done this in less than half the time. And yet he would have had the luxury had he worked on canvas of making it last much longer should he have wanted to. However, um, his, I don't know if this was an experiment. I don't know if he maybe got the hump a bit because he felt that maybe he knew or read had read into the commission that uh, it maybe wouldn't be seen by that many people. I don't quite know why he, i mean the prior at the monastery was constantly moaning about him apparently yeah saying why is it taking so long you know this is taking forever it's a fresco for goodness sake anyway take I mean, the thing and move on leonardo we don't want you here yeah i mean it had already started to seriously deteriorate within about 60 years 50 years and the the, the history seriously. of restoration is like dozens of people over the years wiping the thing down retouching well, cleaning whatever i mean it's it's pretty extensive on and off changes to this thing from what i've read yeah i think the most awful period of restoration for this painting happened in the 17th century and the church employed somebody who was meant to be a highly skilled painter to come in and he 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 wrecked it basically Uh, and luckily whilst he was wrecking it it was recognized that he was wrecking it and so he was fired he was taken off the job yeah um but a lot of the restoration work that would have happened in the 19th century was actually trying to rectify what had happened then rather than even going back to the the original yeah painting they were just and trying to fix the botched job that had happened before i mean i think there was something from- like uh eight or nine different attempts to restore yep um, and, and and problems with i mean the, the wall there was way too much humidity and lichen growing on the wall and like all kinds of problems right like well it's a really um where it is 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 very low yeah and so there, there's a problem with damp and flooding yeah uh, again do you know leonardo would probably have known that <laughs> yeah, i think he's also it's very strange actually i mean a guy like him though i think da vinci is a good example of a guy who while he was this exceptional painter amongst a million <laughs> other things that he did as you said he was a big polymath I think he saw each one of the things he did as just some sort of experiment in the long line of things that he did in his life. Maybe, but I mean, this, you know, this is quite a, as much as, as I said, he might have been a bit, a bit put out if he caught, had got wind of the fact that maybe the Sforza family expected this to be their mausoleum. Yeah. And it would yeah. be then closed. Um, I wonder if that's why he didn't approach this in a more uh, well and 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 the doorway wasn't always there that was cut what in the 1700s 
Yeah, so um, yeah, they cut the door away so Christ's feet are <laughs> taken away. Yeah, exactly. So, um, by the way, that what you're looking at right now on the top is a kind of crappy photograph from the mid '70s of its state, sort of within my life. The day I was born, that's the picture on top, and then the bottom is the current restoration from what was it, ten years ago or fifteen years ago or something. I just want to correct something I said. I said it was 17th century. Actually, the the restoration I was referring to was in 1726, so 18th. So century. the 18th century. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the man was Michelangelo Bellotti. Right. Um, I wrote it down because the story about it is so kind of, it's absurd <laughs> what he did. He filled in cracks of tempera and then covered it with a layer of oil. Again, water and oil. Yeah. Craziness. Um, I mean, it, it, most of the yeah, original paint was hidden. Most of the original paint was hidden under his restoration attempt. Yeah. But I mean, even before that, lots of chunks of pigment were falling off the wall all the time and it had to be yeah, like I mean, that's to do scraped with... down because of the damp and the but living that's... things on it. And... But that actually, you know, as much as we love to celebrate this painting, yeah, uh, you know, that's Leonardo's fault. No, I, I don't doubt that it's Leonardo's fault. I guess my question is, and, and I mean, there, this is a larger question and i've read articles on this and i'm just using this as an example mm -hmm. because this is an extreme example of something that has been beloved for de centuries and been restored a million times mm -hmm. that i look at the bottom one it's you know i was i was doing a lot of research because i couldn't decide between this and some stuff from the sistine ceiling and yeah. and the last judgment which were done in the same sort of time period like mid 90s up through the mid aughts um and in so many ways, I think that these people did all of this as well as you could do now in the sense that they're using their highest level of science and they're looking at it from a microscopic point of view and, and all the rest of it. But there are so many examples like in, in the Michelangelo stuff, especially where they seem to have taken off a whole layer of carbon, figuring that the carbon was all, you know, soot from candles when in fact... He may have at the last stage of his painting gone in and brought in black with carbon black on the wall and mm -hmm. they removed that and the shadows got all lost. I just look at, you know, I look at some of these people's faces and shapes and stuff and it's like, who knows exactly what we're looking at on top from the point of view of like whose paint we're actually looking at. Well, but there is a definitely a more three-dimensional quality to the shapes of the faces and things than there is in the restored version. It's like... How do you know when you've gone too far? Should you just keep your hands off and just let it do what it's going to do? Because you're well, changing it I, even in the restoration, you know? I, I think, you know, the, the, there's a, a bigger question about why do humans make art, you, you know? Okay. And humans are making art to express, yes, but also to make permanent that which can never be. So... Of course, we could go down the avenue of saying that, you know, humans even subconsciously are making artwork to avoid death. Um, but actually, death is unavoidable. And I don't mean death to painting. <laughs> we have sure. a flag. I think that perhaps... Wait, are when... you saying that I am not going to live forever? <laughs> when paintings die back... Uh, why do we feel we need to save them because surely the painting does have a life of its own yeah and yes yeah. through human hand it can suffer but it also suffers in the way that we humans suffer up to a point in the environmental stresses cause it damage sure um you know assailants may attack it sure um, there's lots of things about it that kind of echo or parallel with actual human life and human experience of life into death is one that we just have to accept it. But at the same time, if the people in the 17th century had just let this thing fall off the wall and crumble, hmm. you and I would not be able to have seen this masterpiece of painting. But that in itself is a really curious thing to, to wonder about, isn't it? You know, um, history is so tricksy 
because we think we need it to know now. Yeah. Mm. But maybe if we didn't have such keen awareness of history, we wouldn't have anywhere to hang our biases and our bigotries and our identities. And it would be enormously freeing, wouldn't it? Yeah, but then you're you're going you're going to a place where you're just deconstructing the purpose of art, period, and or at least from a longevity point of view. And all right, yes, if we have no symbols or stories, we're freer to think about our lives differently in in, in ways that we wouldn't before. Um, but why shouldn't that come up in this discussion? Well, I guess it could. I guess maybe, and again, arguably a very Western way of looking at all of this but one that I tend to subscribe to, which is if I were the curator of, you know, what is the church called in Milan? This thing is at? Um, or the Santa monastery? Santa Maria della Grazia, yeah. I think. Okay, yeah, I think it is. Uh, if, if, if I'm the curator of that and it's like for the 30 years, it's not gonna fall apart on my watch. <laughs> you know, like I, like I would never wanna be the person that let something that existed no longer exist only for my lack of work to maintain it. Mm. I know there's such something very, I don't know, maybe it's a respect for the time and energy that, that people put into this stuff. I mean, there was a, there was, I, I was looking at an article about painting restoration and this guy, Barry Bauman, who's a restoration expert, um, was showing this painting and he said, uh, he said, quote, if I were to pull on this and he's like touching a painting, he goes, the whole border would fall off. And when you start to lose paint, there goes the value of the painting. Now mm -hmm. he may be looking at value from a monetary point of view. Yeah. Uh, you could also look at value from a historical or, 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 you know, uh, cultural value point of view. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the, the last supper when I was growing up looked a lot like the one on top. As far mm. as I knew, I've never actually seen it in person. Cause last time I was in Milan, you could not get tickets six months out and go see it in the state at the bottom, but the bottom almost feels like a copy, not the thing that's on the top restored to me. Like it's drastically changed and not just, Oh, the colors are brighter and we got rid of the dirt. Like it feels like a completely different work mm. to me. And so I don't know. It's just, it's, and it, listen, there's differences in the way it was photographed. Who knows like where the black yeah. point is and the white point, like all of that. Yeah. Sure. But, but it, I don't know there. I do have a visceral need for ultimately it comes down to an object and this object is the original and it means something that it's there, you know? Um, I have a hard time throwing out prints of my own work that I don't want anymore. Cause it's like, well, it's a print. If I destroy it, I just throw out something of value. I think, I don't know. I wonder I though, with, with really great respect to the artifacts that we have accumulated through our long human history. Um, that though we may maintain them through care and an observance sure. of that respect, that there's almost like a do not resuscitate order on it when it gets to a point where we have to intervene so much that we change the very nature of what I agree. What is there. There, I mean, I, you know, there, there's, a, there's an example that I was gonna bring up and show, I just couldn't find good images of it, which is, um, you know, I'm a big space nerd and, uh, <laughs> You're a big nerd, did you say? I, 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 love, I love Sandy's just like, yeah, I can imagine that you're a big space nerd. Um, and, you know, I've met a bunch of guys who walked on the moon and, you know, I've- A bunch of lived, guys. I've met six of them, of the 12. <laughs> so yeah, you know. Uh, but, um, but you know, when their suits came back, their suits were made to get to the moon, to keep them alive on the moon and to get them home. They weren't meant to last for 50 years. And when they had, they have them at the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian and they're in drawers and they pull out the drawers and 
the rubber around all the surround is cracking and breaking and deteriorating because the materials itself are just falling apart. And I've had conversations because my sister used to work at the Smithsonian and I had a conversation with one of the curator guys at the air and space. And I said, you know, how do you make decisions? Like, do you replace that grommet, that rubber grommet? Cause, or do you let the crumbled one stay there and just let the thing kind of fall apart? You know, like what, at what point is it no longer the thing that it is, you know, it's ship of Theseus kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And of course it's like you were saying as, as much a philosophical question as it is anything else. I think with art, the objects are, have more, are, are typically intended to last longer on purpose, right? You know, this is yeah. why people used oil paints and rock at the beginning anyway. Um, but I, it, what, what, what really is interesting is when you get into, and could you go to the next slide, please? Um, you get into the 20th century and you have all these guys and gals in the middle of the 20th century using materials that were not meant to last all that long. You know, they're using paints from the store down the street. They're using a blanket that's yellowing and falling apart because it's just fabric from a quilt, you know? Um, you know, I'm sure, I don't know what this looked like when Rauschenberg made it in 1955 but I'm pretty sure it didn't look this yellowed and, and haggard, you know? Um, I love, I just, I, uh, the thing I love about bed is, is actually not necessarily the Reichenberg aspects of it. It's more, it's more the human relationships that led to it as a thing. So the uh, patchwork yep. quilt, and belonged to what was her name Dorothea Rockborn Rockburn another artist who Reichenberg had met at Black Mountain College when he was there and she's famously quoted as saying like you know the last time I saw my quilt was in the laundry room the student laundry room at Black Mountain College that son of a bitch yeah the yeah yeah time, <laughs> the next time she saw it where was it the Leo Castelli gallery <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, we were supposed to be friends and he stole my patchwork quilt and now it's in one of the most celebrated. Um, yeah, I wonder, did he even. The first combine that he made, actually, apparently. Did he remember one. where he got it or did, did, did he just like, had it was in his studio and the story goes that he didn't have any canvas, right? So then he just started messing around. But like, do, do we think though that he, it was uh, just happened to be in his possession or that he knew that it was something that he kind of, picked up in college from somebody else Rauschenberg uh unreliable narrator probably ascribed to the kind of Picasso sentiment of you know like good artists borrow and great artists steal in I this think, case literally yeah and no but that that's so relevant to this isn't it I mean yeah a yeah. lot of what Rauschenberg is doing is is actually about <laughs> stealing <laughs> taking from things from sources that aren't expected obviously, and applying them to change the very nature of what painting could be. Now, for that way, I am very grateful. Um, but I just, I find it amazing that someone would, would, you know, hunt around their dormitory for their patchwork quilt and not really realize I do it. wonder, though, what this is going to look like in another 50 years, you know. Well, also, Will it still is, be is holding together? To, is somebody going to restore it if it starts that's, to go a bit gnarly? You that's know? the question. Like, it, like with stuff like this, and then, I mean, you look at all of the Pollock paintings and things that were literally just crappy, like enamel and, and plastic paints that he bought at the, at the store. It's like, these things were, these are not archival materials. These are not papers without brighteners in them. These are not, you know, these, and, and you can see it, especially a lot of the stuff at MoMA from the 20th century even in the 20, 30 years that I've been looking at it looks different than it did when I got there. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like even, even in my lifetime of seeing this art, it has decayed. And it's funny because if somebody coming in, if I, if I take, you know, Heather's little sister, Sophie to MoMA and we're walking around and we start looking at this thing and we're talking and she's 18, this might be the first time she sees this thing. And it's in this state for her now, 30 years from now, it'll be in a different state. Right. Which is, but that, Part of the art, it's decaying, for, it's changing over time. Reichenberg, yeah. that would actually be completely okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, right. And I just want to read what he said. So a year after he painted this, 
So this is 1955. In 1956, talking about his combine, or his, I think he'd done maybe th three, four of them by then, um, he said, I consider the text of a newspaper, the detail of a photograph, the stitch in a baseball, and a filament in a light bulb as fundamental to the painting as brush stroke on enamel drip or enamel drip of paint. In the end, what one sees as my work is what I choose to make with no guarantee of enlightenment, humour, beauty or art. So that's enormously freeing. Absolutely. For him but as the artist, but also for the viewer. For the viewer, but if you're the curator at MoMA, that's great that this thing's, that Rauschenberg's okay with this thing changing and decaying and that's part of the thing. Mm. But does he want it to fall apart on his watch or her watch? Well, I mean, like, there's what, lots of work that's really what, interesting we could talk about now that is quite deliberately about the process of, of ending. Yeah, I, I almost chose, what is the artist who has the granite block that he sticks the head of lettuce and you stick the granite block on the other side and you tie it with wire. And as the the lettuce wilts, the outer block falls into a piece of sawdust. It's like, you know, showing time passing or whatever. And it's like, that's really interesting, but that was like, time is an element of that work, you know? That is slightly different than I think this. Do you know, one of the uh, most extraordinary student exhibitions I ever went to was at, um, was at the Arts University of Bournemouth and it was a fine art show and sometimes that can be a bit hit and miss. But this was <laughs> a large suspended um, sugar, like a, a giant candy suspended from the ceiling, almost like we were in an abattoir. It was like okay. it's red candy. It was a huge sheet of it. So someone had um, animals in your walls. No, I'm just <laughs> I'm being distracted. Uh, someone had candy. I can't remember what I was saying. Oh, You're yeah. saying the candy hanging from the ceiling, yeah. Yeah, the candy hanging from the ceiling. Yeah, it was amazing because the whole the whole point of it, obviously this is pre-COVID, was that visitors to the show, to the degree show, would go and you could eat parts of this hanging body of sugar, really. Yeah, sure. And so on day one of the exhibit, it was a, a solid mass, a giant rectangle. And then by the end of the summer show it was in fact some of it had almost like melted the sugar had somehow melted down there was a pool of it on the on the floor and it had been yeah. nibbled away by visitors and I, I thought that was i mean maybe very obvious but also fun and sure kind of beautiful yeah, I mean, there was the what's the uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, that guy who you know put piles of candy that were the weight of his partner that he lost to AIDS, mm. you know, and you could go just it's just piles of it in the corner and you go take a piece if you want it. Yeah, um, I mean, there's also, I mean, there's those kinds of things which are interesting and are almost performance art, you know, they're as much as they are an object, you know. Well, we were um, never supposed to, but we went to Turbine Hall when I we had his. Um, the, the, the seeds, pumpkin seeds, ceramic pumpkin seeds, each yeah. one had been handcrafted. And I think people weren't quite sure if you were supposed to or allowed to pick them up. Lots of people took them. Yeah. And so even though the, the installation was in you know, a monumental, vast installation of all these handmade ceramic. But enough people seeds, pick them up, it goes bye-bye. Yeah, I mean, th those kinds of changes in the, the physical nature of artwork is really, but, really but I mean, about, actually. sure. And certainly for that kind of work, I don't know that in Rembrandt's time, they were thinking about it that way, you know. Um, no, but or, I also come back to this idea that perhaps they wouldn't have been so precious about the fact that, you know, it would have been a great yeah. honor to have a, a whole wall in a town hall devoted sure, to yeah. your painting and so the fact yeah. that the original was too big of course it should be cut down yeah i just wish they had shifted it just a little bit to the left 
when they did it. But then again, then you cut off the two people on the right because they're so close to the edge and they matter more that you have to. It's just the balance and weight of Night Watch is just completely different with that in there. Although I do wonder so if interesting. somebody deliberately cut it in that way because they did at least attempt to retain a sense of asymmetry. Yeah. So yeah, or, or I think I think that's true, and I think it's just that those those people on the left could be lost if you cut off more on the right. You're literally cutting the middle of the drummer and the and the guy with the pike's head off. The the, the asymmetry I'm talking about is through the the movement of the. Oh, arch. you think the asymmetry? Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, you think they were trying to move the people. Uh, yeah into the center more and the arch off to the side mm. yeah i think mm. i think maybe they were doing the best they could to keep it the way it was but it was just easier to cut off from the left than the right <clears throat> like the stuff on the left mattered less than the stuff on the right mm. but it's interesting i mean would you would you want if let's say google used similar techniques to take a high-res picture from 1975 version of the last supper and say, if we were to digitally fix this, fix, wrong word, uh, restore this, uh, would that be interesting to you? Do you think that that's an interesting way to go to be able to save these things without mucking about with the physical, the physical objects? As I said, when we were talking about the Rembrandt at the start, I think that that kind of restoration uh, that exists digitally Part of me balks at that, but the other part of me thinks that's a really respectful way to do it because there's no tampering. Yeah. Wait, why do, why, why do you balk at it? Just because I, you know, that everything becomes digitized somehow is rather depressing. Well, welcome to the world of NFTs. Uh, do you think that, <laughs> but imagine I don't if somebody's want to like, think any more about non fungible tokens. Honestly. Imagine if somebody goes down into the basement of the town hall one time and like cleans out a room and finds those strips rolled up in a box somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Could you imagine? And they open them up and it's actually like a like a purple alien that was over there. It had nothing, it wasn't like that at all. <laughs> That'd be really funny. Um anyway, that was a that was a fun conversation, Sandy. <laughs> well, thank you for picking the the slides, the images. There is a lot of much bigger questions about art though in this topic. Absolutely. You know, like, I just, what, I didn't want to go too deep off the reservation because then we could just dive, you know, into the ocean. I like going off the edge. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs>